Today, we're going to be talking about one of the most challenging topics that many intermediate players happen to experience, and this is how exactly shall we recognize tactical patterns. So this is a very important topic because first of all recognizing tactical patterns can help you to sometimes you know save a completely winning position or sometimes it can actually help you to find the final break that you can do against your opponent. There are so many things that relate to, to being able to recognize the right tactical and combinational patterns when the position you know requires you to. The problem, though, is that many chess players believe that it's all about working on combinations, working on tactics. If they say, if you do work on tactics and you repeat and repeat, I'll help you to get sharp. Now, I agree with that. This is actually true. However, however, there are other concepts that you should know and you should understand before improving tremendously in the ability to recognize the correct tactical patterns in a given position. So first of all we're going we're gonna to talk about is we're not going to begin with an actual combination. Now I'm going to show you a game, personally a very interesting game in one of my favorite openings that was played by the great grandmaster Miguel Nidorf. The game I'm going to show you is not a long one but it will kind of teach you the process of uh, you know learning to recognize a tactical pattern and what you can do in order to improve in that. So um, basically we're going to see that um, Nidorf was actually playing as black. This was a game that was played between Grandmaster Miguel Nidorf with black against uh, someone named Glucksberg or Glinsberg. I don't know exactly what his name was but basically it was named the Polish Immortal game. It was played in Warsaw 1929. I'm pretty sure that many of you haven't seen that game, although it's very interesting. And I think it's really good for a start of what we're going to do today. So, the game started off with d4. Okay. For those of you who want to learn most out of this game, I'll recommend you to get the black pieces in front. You can do it with a right click on the board and then flip board, or just press and control and F. That will help you to actually uh, get black pieces in front. And so after d4, f5, c4, knight f6, knight c3, and e6, we have an opening that actually is called the stall wall. I personally find it rather solid. And in most times, there are not that many tactical possibilities in that one. So you have to know that you, we can't expect to see a lot of lots of tactical ideas. Nevertheless, um, the line is interesting. And the idea of it, basically, with d5, is that black gets a solid, stable command in the center. And eventually, he can turn it into either uh, attack in the white center or perhaps an attack on the king side. That's what this opening is all about. So after d5, white played e3. Not a very good system. Usually the best way to handle the stone wall is when white develops his dark square bishop out there. Or he plays g3 so that he can play bishop g2. Both of the moves are going to take away the black easy way to line up the bishop towards h2 or it will help white to set up a, a valuable defender near his position on the g2. So it's a, it's a pretty solid way to go. He didn't do it, which is actually not so great for white. When he didn't do it, he played e3, which is something that many intermediate or even beginner players will do. Uh, well, black played c6, okay, bishop d3, and bishop to d6. Okay, short castles happens, black castles as well. And what we see is that both white and black are now developing the pieces. Remember that recognizing tactical patterns uh, really happens to be something that we do quite a bit later. That you have to know that. You can't just say, all right, now I want to know how to recognize tactics immediately, because you can't recognize tactics if they're not there, right? So all that development and preparation and consistent, you know, p the consistent ability to bring pieces out is going to get you in the position where you can recognize tactics. But you got to be patient. Don't think about tactics all the time. There are people who do that, and that's actually not good. So you have to take it easy, one step at a time. So after the move of uh, bishop to the d6, and this is played, um, essentially. White decided to continue with uh, okay, uh, knight e2. Uh, this move looks weird, 
But in this position, uh, the move of knight e3 is actually connected with a possible idea of knight f4. And if black exchanges the knight, then the recapture happens. Essentially, there will be the e line open, and black is going to have a little bit of an I, no, I wouldn't say isolated, but rather backward pawn that can't move forward. And a move of knight e4 to blockade it will be met by f3. So essentially, the knight from f4 will be blockading the dark squared bishop, and it will be adding some further pressure at e6. That's, I suppose, the idea to strengthen the white king side a bit more. So now what black does is just knight b to d7, a natural developing move, nothing else needs to happen. So what he decided, to, instead of following his normal plan with uh, like uh, knight f4, he just decided to play knight g5. Now one of you said, I just joined, can you tell me what side are we looking at? We're looking at the black side, so I'll recommend you to actually look at it from the from the black perspective. So um, this is this is quite important. Now, <clears throat> Knight g5 is a bit of a brave move, so to speak, in this position. So, um, actually, let's see. I mean, th this is this is a pretty straightforward thing right here. But the question is, what do you think Black should do at this position? You see, I, I also want to make it interesting for some of the beginner audiences. So, if you're thinking that this is too elementary, now. This is, you know, that's obviously not a question for you. So, let's see. I mean, I I don't want to just talk only about the advanced players because we also need to to learn how to how to spot some simple tactics. And for those of you who are from a beginner to to an intermediate level, um, basically, how to spot the tactic that may be there, may be simple, and yet we want to make sure that we're not going to miss it. Right? This is a very important thing. Now, first of all, remember the following. The very basic idea about recognizing patterns of tactic is when we try to think about what are the motives in the position. Now, when I may first made my, made my tactics DVD, tactic DVDs, uh, people were very concerned about the, pa the, the term of motive that I always talk about. So they say motive, what does that mean? Isn't it called motif? And it's like these, uh, you know, perhaps pin and all these things like hanging piece or whatever. In some way that's true. However, um, we also have one more thing. Motive, in my opinion, is essentially what we call a weakness. But the, the difference is that a weakness could be just a weak piece. And motive is, is anything that can allow the opposite side to make a combination. So this is very important. The first thing you need to do is to recognize motives. More recognizing motives requires to look at the position, both ours and our opponents, and think about what could be the weaknesses. Now, if you really look at this position right now, you realize that black has a motive of the weakness on e6. It's a temporary thing, but still not so good. And what about white? Do you see anything that is without protection or something that just he, he has undefended? Because I do. I, I do realize that in this moment, there is something that's not too brilliant. That knight on g5 is too far advanced. Now, I, I personally appreciate the advanced pieces, but there's something bad about them, too. When they're advanced, they're vulnerable, and you just need to remember that. When, the, when a piece stands a little more advanced as it is, it could be a problem. And now we realize that there is the x-ray of the black queen that stands right against this, you know, that, that point. And that's very uncomfortable, in my opinion. This is going to be very, very unpleasant. I have to agree with that. So, you're right. What we do, you can play the move of knight g4, but not right now, because I will play f4. So you see, if you find the motive, okay, remember to look at one thing. Look at the forcing moves. Forcing moves happen to be three types. We have checks, we have captures, and we have direct threats in this order. It's very important that you think about them in this order so that you make sure you don't miss something. And so I think that right now we have the idea of a check. As you suggested, this is really what needs to happen out there. After that check that is taking place, we get to realize that if white takes back with the king, there is knight g4 and things go bad. Now, of course, another question is going to be, okay, so I, I see, this is a great, but uh, really, I mean, how do I find that? So when to look for it? Looking at those type of mo you know like motives and forcing moves, so to speak, just needs to happen at a position or at a kind of situation in which you feel like uh, you're you're ready. Now, understanding when to look for this is a totally different subject. Of course, so when you work in a lot of tactics, you develop the intuition about these things. However, here it's just after bishop takes h2, 
White is losing a pawn and his position starts to collapse. Now the game may seem quite uh, easy afterwards, but it's not. I specifically have a very important question, which is the reason why I brought that game. Usually I bring up a lot more complex examples. Why well, didn't take the bishop? He moved king h1, after which we have a question. Do we retreat the bishop, or do we move the knight? I mean, moving the knight could be a little bit of risky, because essentially that bishop has to, uh, you know, will, will stay a little behind. But what would you do? What do you think is the best thing to do at this point? See, this is a <clears throat> one of the most important questions because obviously uh, bringing the knight up and going foul forward is going to give us activity. But how to decide if this is exactly what we want to do, or perhaps this may be somewhat riskier at this point. So it's not that simple, so to speak. So how can we say what is really the best thing to do in this position? What would you like to do? That's a really really good question. We just need to figure out how to or no, how to how to figure it out. I like to say yeah, knight g4 absolutely. You know why this move is really so good? Okay. The reason why this move is so good is because it's creating an attack and it's safe. Yes. People like the initiative and I like the initiative too. But what you need to know about initiative is that initiative could sometimes be risky. If you believe you're winning and you see a very active move that can just help you to keep on the attack, don't do it before you ask yourself the question, does that move create any risks to my position? Don't do it before you've asked yourself that question. If you do and you haven't asked, it could be it could be a risk. So right now we get to realize that after knight g4 there's no risk because we are attacking on f4 and that's good. A lot of these active moves out of winning positions may actually present a risk. And because you're so much, you know, comfortable with the winning position, everything you've got, people tend to forget about the risk that they can take. So that was the move for sure. Knight came up to the g4, so the attack is happening, and white is in a bad position. All right, that was great. So after the move happened, white obviously has quite a bit to worry about. So his next move in the position was um, okay. Knight queen, yeah, knight g4, f4, and now black plays queen e8. It defends the pawn, while at the same time the queen is actually go reaching out for the h5, and it's going to get ready for the checkmate. So g3, queen h5, the only way for the white king to run is through g2. So now we have a, a an interesting question. How would you continue as black? Now obviously black has set up a, a tremendous peace fist. That's what we call peace fist. If you think about what is the best thing you can do in order to increase your attack, consider bringing as many pieces as possible right where you're attacking. When you do that, you're going to get this piece fist, as we call it, like three pieces right there, uh, adding adding a bit to the pressure against White's position and making his game more difficult. So Black has already done that. The question, of course, is how can we use that piece fist against our opponent? It's a decent question, very important one, and I guess we need to figure it out. Now I just I just got the first suggestion. What will happen if we just get to take on the uh, G3? Yeah, I mean that looks like a fast move, but um, yeah, all right. Let's talk about it. Is it really a good idea to take out there? No. You see, that can't be good. It, not before you've calculated it precisely. You've lo you've looked through it carefully. If you do a move like Bishop takes G3, or if you're looking for any tactical combination, even if you recognize the pattern, don't forget that the only way on how you can be precise about it is if you ask yourself how he can counter you or what would you do if you were in his position do you know how little how 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 few how many few people actually do that not that many people do that people believe in the big sacrifice in the effective move and and you know almost like their mind is working in their advantage they say okay if i do that i'll be great i'll do this and this wow this is fantastic let's do it and then they see that they've made a mistake but um, it's too late so my suggestion is before you just commit yourself to a big move that contains a risk, if it doesn't contain a risk, that's fine. But before you commit yourself to a move that could be risky, ask yourself, is that move going to present any, you know, like, danger to me? If I see that kind of move, I have the feeling that something's not going to go right. And I'm right about that, actually. You can see, after bishop takes g3, well, it's got rook to h1 in that case. And uh, I think after rook h1, 
bishop h2 because otherwise we lose the bishop White's going to do a move like knight f3 and most likely at this point uh, there will be the possibility of uh, you know knight takes h2 and uh, yeah that's not good so I'm guessing right now going back to the earlier position uh, bishop takes g is not working you see not always the best looking moves are the most powerful actually I've seen totally the opposite moves that look great and are very powerful turn out to be really quite bad when you do them so that's what you gotta, you gotta keep in mind I don't think that uh, the move bishop takes g3 is going to work now I like the idea of bringing the queen to the h2 it's, it's great it's great really if we can get it there that will add pressure it will help us but obviously we can't do that right now so easily so let's think what about the possibility to play bishop to g1 okay that, that's a different move at least this way we're not going to let the opponent to make the defense see that is how you have to think when you see a tactic you know most just players when they look at a tactic and they see there's not what's not working you know what they do they immediately say okay that's not working let's let's leave it so let's think about something else and I think that they're making the biggest type of mistake why because instead of leaving that move just because you know you didn't you didn't find how it could work the better idea is to think about why it didn't work and make whatever is necessary so that it actually works you see this is in my opinion one of the most critical thing that's what you gotta do so like if you see that some candidate move just for whatever reason did not act did not work find out what's the reason what's making it impossible what's making it difficult now I'm thinking or have that feeling that it's just because of rook h1. If we do bishop to the h, or bishop to g1, we realize that the queen will, su will shortly be open, and we're going to have the opportunity of bringing the our queen further down to h2. It was great. Well, that's exactly what black what black did. So um, can we do that immediately? I mean, I, I suppose that shouldn't require so much of a calculation. Yeah, I mean, bishop g1. If he doesn't have that, it should be successful. No whatever you do calculate it calculation I think is the final stage of making sure your analysis or the combination or the, pa or the pattern you've seen is good or it's working it may be good but it may not be working so if you, you must think about the ideas you may fi must find out what, what patterns are there you know or what move candidates and finally you start calculating now if white takes with a king obviously he's gonna get checkmated if he takes with the rook he's still gonna get checkmated we give a check his king will move and then we give a checkmate from f2 so I suppose the biggest move why it can have is knight takes to the g1 now let me teach you on how to how you're calculating so for example we do knight takes to the g queen h2 king f3 now there's no checkmate out there that doesn't mean that the line is bad we just need to know how to continue so what do we do out there I mean after uh, knight takes g1 queen h2 king f3 now we started calculating obviously and you're gonna say, okay, but Valerie, this lecture is not about calculations, it's about how to recognize tactical patterns, right? Well, you can recognize tactical patterns with the suggestion that I gave you when it comes to the start of a variation or a start of a tactic. However, when it comes down to the middle of a tactical combination, you can't use the same way. You can't just think about, oh, let's see what's weak, so let's find out the motives. You can do that, but I believe there's something else. Okay, now one of you asks, uh, can we do rook f6 and knight df6? Sure, but we shouldn't have gone with bishop to the g1. You see, obviously, quiet move is not bad. The problem of the quiet moves is that the quiet moves often lose our initiative. Remember, if you play a move that's quiet or simple, I mean, white can probably exchange in d5. You can do rook h1, and we got a problem with that bishop. We got a problem with our queen. We got a problem with the knight. One move but it was enough just to lose to lose our initiative and everything that we've been we've been fighting for so I, I don't like that I, I honestly don't don't think this is gonna work too nicely so looking at the position and what is supposed to happen out there I just don't feel like it's gonna work so let's get back that's obviously not too perfect is there anything else we could do possibly yes we just have to figure out what it is going to be and how to make it work so rook f6 no bishop g1 now knight takes g1 queen h2 and king f3 so how do we recognize what's coming after the king comes down to f3 okay one of you asked but Valerie we need more pieces to the attack um well uh, without calculations I think it is hard to find patterns no now you have to remember that there, you have to look at patterns in two actually I would even say three specific moments 
of your calculate of your analysis. First, in the beginning of the position, what if you calculate and you've missed a very simple pattern, a very simple move candidate candidate because of that pattern, like a weakness or something, and you just start calculating a bunch of completely useless variations. That that will not be good. You see, you need to look at motives. You need to recognize the right combinational pattern, something that you can exploit at the beginning. Then, when you start analyzing how you can work again, you know, to, towards that pattern, how you can take advantage, then there comes another moment in which you can't advance your attack quite easily, and then you have to look at other patterns, other motives and weaknesses. So. Knight takes g1, queen h2, king f3. Now, white's king seems to be quite cut from squares. Now, I believe that this is a very important pattern you find. White's king, a very important motive. White's king has nowhere to go, but what is the real problem? I think the real problem is that we don't have any open lines. We don't have any real possibility to reach it out. I figure if we find a way to resolve this, then there will be no issue with the ability to checkmate or you know really do some big stuff against him. So now all in all what we need to find is a way to get rid of the uh, pawns or anything else that might be defending him in a decent way. I guess the f4 and the d4 these pawns are doing a pretty good support in defense so e5 naturally absolutely right. So can we stop the calculation? No. You stop only when things get simple. When everything is easy, then you stop. Until that point, you gotta visualize. Now, is it for every time like that? No. As long as there is a risk, you can do that. You have to visualize. But when there's no risk, okay, if you believe that this line is good, go for it. Right now, we're sacrificing a bishop, so we can't just say, I'm good, e5 and I'm good. So, knight takes g, queen h2, king f3, then actually we play e5. Okay, I hope you're visualizing. If you don't, just try to concentrate here. This is very important. And then after the move, e5 white will play d takes d. So what we have in this position is that we need to destroy the main defenders of the opponent. So we could perhaps do a move like knight takes d5. You take back with the pawn. We're gonna take with the knight. Now this this gets a little more, a little too too complicated. So you're gonna say, okay, Valerie, just hold on for a second. This is a little too cloudy in my head. Now, if you want to visualize, remember this. Try to visualize which piece have disappeared over the board and which piece have changed their positions. Everything else, like 90% of the position, literally is the same. Don't forget that. Now, what about queen h1? Okay, so don't don't switch to variations like this. But okay, let's let's go to queen h1. If we begin with bishop g1, rook takes g1, uh, sorry, knight takes g1, I mean. We have queen f2 check, queen h2, king f3. Can we do queen h1? Sure, but then he's going to run. See, he's going to run down to e2, e1, or even d2. We have nothing. So, after knight takes g1, queen h2, king f3, pawn to e5, pawn takes to e5, knight takes to e5, f takes to e5. We can take it with the knight. It's getting very dangerous for the white king, and still there's no checkmate because he's going to use the f4 square. So, what we have right now is that this knight has changed his position to e5. Our queen is on h2. Okay. Our uh, white's knight has changed his position to g1, and the e6, d4, and f4 pawns are gone, together with the knight from d7. Now, it may be a little complicated, but try to visualize it. This is very important. Now, are we looking for a win? No. Remember, in such lines, you're looking for one specific pattern. We call that the minimum. The minimum is that type of situation in which you know that whatever happens, no matter how bad it is, it's not going to be losing. And as long as you believe you have good prospects and you have a, a decent, a good minimum, then you wouldn't have to worry about too much about uh, taking into this line, even if there is a chance to make an actual mistake. So we can say, I'm going to have the perpetual with knight g6, then what will have to go back, I can bring that knight right up to e5, and uh, by just doing back and forth, at the very least, we're not going to lose the game. So I'm guessing, uh, you know, going for that kind of variation will help us to get a sort of perpetual. And uh, if we see something else, perhaps we can achieve even more in that position. Can we do it? Definitely. See, now we go on with the line because we believe that there is something more coming with that, and certainly, that's just what happened. So, bishop g1, knight takes g1, there's the check. White's king goes up, and then suddenly after that move, uh, black decided that e5 is coming. d takes d, 
and knight takes d5. Now, one of you said, always interesting, where is the key of the position? The key of the position is the moment where essentially you believe that after that move the game is going to change. That well, that's what I call the the key of the position. If, uh, if essentially you can't find any solution of that of that type of situation, like you you feel like it's going to change, but you can't find out how to make it favorable, then perhaps you don't have to go in that line. But right now, I believe we have a very decent idea on what's coming. After knight takes d5 and then king f4, at the very least we have a perpetual. Did that perpetual really take place? Well, black gave one check. And now what do we do? Okay, so what is your suggestion about black at this point? It's a very important position in my opinion, so we really have to figure out what is black supposed to do next. So what do you think? White's pairs are behind. The king has no flight squares, which means that it's very limited for on its on its present place. So I guess what we need to ask is, uh, okay, shall we just go on for the perpetual? Or perhaps we could actually figure out something more. Something that will help us to achieve even more than just a draw. Hmm. You know how often I've been in those type of positions and not knowing exactly what I have to do. And I've, uh, you know, I was feeling really bad. I get in a position like that, I feel like there is something and I can't find it. And I keep looking and I still can't find it. And then I realized, when I was younger, I actually realized that all I have to do is just to ask myself one question. And really, it was so simple. I asked my, myself that question and things go great. That question is, what is the problem? Really, looking at this position, what is the main obstacle? Why can't we destroy him? And I think that there is only one reason for that. It's not because of our pieces. It's not because of the White King. It's enough bad. The reason why we can't win, in my opinion, is because there is the f file, f pawn. So in order to attack, you really need to open up as many lines as possible because then you can get the ability to attack him. If you don't have enough lines, it may be a little bit harder for you to get the threats going. And so right now, Black's got cu quite a few pieces, but all of them, or at least the majority of them, seem to be behind. So Black decided to figure that out with f4. Of course, f4 is the right way. I think that you need to understand that one of the most valuable elements and patterns of leading the attack isn't just to have a good weakness and good amount of pieces. A, a lot of a lot of the pe of a lot of the masters, the players who actually believe that the attack is successful, know that in order for your pieces to reach the opponent's target, you also need lines. So at some point, if you find out that your attack isn't working for whatever reason, ask yourself. Do I have the chance to open up some more lines? Because if you have, perhaps you need to do it. And then will, that opening will create the bridge that you need so that you can reach out for the opponent. F4 was great. After that move, obviously White's got one thing to do, and that's, of course, obviously taking that pawn. And, uh, okay, let's see actually how it happened. In the game, he played with E, X, F, and Black found a very beautiful finale. Bishop G4 check, yes. Let's extract the White King even further. Now we realize one very interesting pattern. This is called extraction. See, sometimes, in order to take advantage of certain weakness of your opponent, you don't need to do to anything too special. All you need to do is kind of force your opponent or extract him a little further. If he goes into a more of an advanced position, it will be easier for you to reach and attack, just like what Black is doing against White's King right now. King takes G4 happened, and after that move, of course, there was knight e5. The idea is to prevent his way from coming back, which is led by h5, and black's getting white's getting checkmated. Wow. Well, black started from his very move of bishop g1 with something very special, and you can recognize it as initiative. The initiative is like the sequence of forcing moves in a row against the opponent that just don't let him to get out. And remember, you don't have to you don't have to have everything figured out from the beginning. Black didn't. I don't know if he did or he didn't, but you don't need to. All you need to have is a good idea. Remember, you need a good idea on what you're actually thinking about, what, what, what can happen as a minimum. And if you got the minimum and you believe that this minimum is enough, sure, just don't worry. Go for it. Now I believe we got a very se a decent idea, and uh, certainly after the move of uh, Knight takes e5, everything looked perfect. 
So a good example, and, and I mean, in my opinion, nice principles to be to be realized. Now, of course, there is something else too. So don't worry about it. It's not it's not over. Now, I'd like to show you a little more complex ex complex example about how you can recognize actually tactical patterns. And uh, this this example that I'd like to show you is just so interesting and intriguing. So let me bring it up, and uh, we can see. <clears throat> the next game that we're going to see was played actually by not anybody else, but in fact it was the great Bobby Fischer. Now Fischer, obviously, was one of the greatest players of spotting right tactics. You, you but you, you already know that. So I think I think it's interesting to see the, a game of Fischer because Fischer was one of these players who knew exactly how to make the right position when a certain tactic actually appears and that that is what you have to remember so what you need to know is that it's like if you want to make the right beautiful combination you can't just rely on that to happen well sometimes they happen but the important is that you have to build your position you have to build until you act in, until you finally get into that when when you finally get into the position okay you'll be ready you can do whatever you want but uh, you know it's it's important that you get to build and this next game is in one of my favorite openings I have to tell you this and it's just it's just so good okay so hold on for one second why was Fisher a great player <laughs> that's the joke right okay thank you for asking that well I, I guess I guess you can google it okay so this is a very good counter answer alright so Fisher was playing white and the game was played between Fisher and uh, someone named uh, Myax Marsuren yes it was played in the interzonal tournament in 1967 yeah very uh, like a prestigious tournament the interzonal was actually like the candidates these years so Fisher was playing in 1967 some years before he actually became a world champion so okay um, alright so well, Fisher was white so this time you can flip the board to get white pieces he started off with e4 e6 d3 d5 Knight d2 and black blade knight f6 pawn to g3 this is one of these openings that are like kind of close but only close for the opponent you know <laughs> there's some openings that are actually closed but close for the opponent I, I think that this is one of the most intriguing ways to meet the French if somebody's thinking about how should I play against French here's how Fisher plays it that that was one of his favorite openings when he was younger it's called the King Indian attack and so after uh, knight c6 actually then uh, white played knight g f3 bishop b7 short castles and after black castle on the short side white played e5 okay so far what we see is just the development um, essentially just to give you an idea this opening is about white getting a pawn on e5 which serves like a pawn nail into black's position literally that pawn just cuts off anything that black could do or try by bringing some you know a few fewer pieces around the king's side and while that pawn is keeping some of black's pieces away essentially the good news is that it can it holds more space so I could certainly think about uh, using that space in order to get more uh, more firepower or eventually some attacks on the king's side that's a that's a useful thing actually so you play with rookie one and uh, after that move black did b5 okay so how do we get to a position in which tactics really appear I suppose that's one of your major questions to ask so really how do we get that it's not easy you see <laughs> so sometimes as I said tactics just happen but in order to get them on many occasions what you need to do is to start building uh, what I call as features. You need to get more features and more possibilities and just do it. Now, how to do that is not actually so, uh, it's not so difficult. Here is what you need to do first. Number one concept if you want to get good possibilities is remember concentrate on bringing more pieces directly against the opponent's king or whatever is the target usually the king that you'd like to attack against this is the biggest idea so make sure you get as many pieces as you can right there right into your attack nothing matters more so how does white do it knight f1 it's a slow and yet consistent maneuvering of the pieces we don't need anything too special we just want to get enough power firepower 
against the black king. That's what he did. Okay, so knight f1, and after black played with b4, there was the move h4. Black plays a5, and now white does bishop f4. Nothing tactical is yet happening, and still the idea is just that the more we bring our forces on that king side, we, we can succeed. Now, <laughs> there's a question here. Do we just go on on the king side, or we actually want to make a move like a3 in order to blockade him on that side of the board? What would you like to do? Would you like to go on and eventually advance on king side without touching pawns on the queen side? On, on the queen side, or you believe it's nice to take a moment or two to blockade him and prevent the opponent from making anything special out there? What, what would you say needs to be done at this point? Yeah, one of you just said yes to end all private tells. Bobby was an example to me so much over. I, I was just teasing Valerie a bit. Sorry. <laughs> now I, I got it. I got it. No, I mean like uh, it's 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 interesting that you see every great player in the history has given something to the world, and Fisher was one of the players who actually introduced how important it is to play dynamic chess. How important it is like to to introduce the right concept in every position so that you know what to think about and that's really not so easy and it's very difficult very challenging so most chess players like to play technically it's nice to play technically but in order to really get this brilliant technique of knowing what to do in every position to recognize the right path and whether it will be a tactical or positional really requires a lot of knowledge and concentration so obviously that's something that just Fisher now knew how to do okay so uh, I would not touch pause in queenside because it opens columns right See, that's probably the, the thing that I would not do too. I mean, why why should we touch pawns? I mean, that would just looks look bad, right? Then why did Bobby Fischer play the move of pawn a3? I mean, it makes no sense, doesn't it? It's like why would we ever like to do a move like that, which could simply, which simply for like, creates weaknesses? <laughs> I just believe that he violated one of the most valuable concepts don't play on the side of the board where you're going with one single purpose the purpose of this move is to care not so much about okay what black is trying or doing on the queen side but blockade the pawn those pawns you can do a little bit of a blockade it's not wrong just make a little bit of a move to prevent him as long as it doesn't give your opponent any threats or doesn't create any weaknesses now is it justified I don't know. I mean, it's there's always a risk when you play a move like that one, when you start pushing on the wrong side of the board. But, in some way, A3 prevents the opponent from playing up there. So this is kind of a blockade that uh, Black was, I suppose, very sure about, and he knew it's, it's going to work. So, he did it, and, uh, okay, after the move of uh, pawn A3, in that position, Black exchanged it, White recaptured as well, and after knight a5, white played knight e3. Now some of you will say, okay, but Valerie, isn't that pawn a bit of a weakness out there as it stands on a3? Perhaps, perhaps it is a bit of a problem out there, but black is just behind so much, so he can't exploit it. And white obviously wanted to prevent these pawns from moving any further, so it was a good choice. I mean, who are we to judge Bobby Fischer's strategy, right? Now, it was, it was a really nice move. As, uh, like a sweet and a good blockade. So knight e3, Bishop a6. And now I know you're going to ask, but Valerie, where is the tactics right now? We don't see any tactics going on, are they? Not yet. See, that's what I was just saying. you got to know when to look for them. And most of the times, you don't look for them until the right position really happens. When the right position occurs, you can think of it. But not yet. We need preparation. We need forces. We need attacking power and pieces on the line. So his next move is simply Bishop h3. A little continuation, just so that we can get ready and utilize the bishop against white black's pawn on e6. It was a nice move, I have to say that. And uh, okay, after that move actually happened, white chose to continue with pawn d4 in order to force white's knight away. You're probably going to say that Fisher brought it on g4. Maybe so do I, but he didn't. Why? Because if you put it on g line that would close the road of the queen. And here I'd like to tell you that uh, in order to get the right attacking position where you can recognize tactical patterns and possibilities you need to use this schematic thinking. Now schematic thinking helps in both tactical and positional games but mainly in tactical. How does schematic think works? Schematic thinking works when you figure out or you try to visualize where you want to think about your pieces to go. 
So for instance, if we think about our having our knight on g5, if we think about bringing our queen to h5, then using a couple of these pieces right directly there, and perhaps even that knight from e3 at some point later, that would be great. But we definitely care a lot more about having a queen on h5 directly against white's king, rather than uh, making sure that our knight is in g4. So, even though it looks passive, Fischer chose to play knight f1. Yeah, a backward move, which yet follows or is followed by knight g5. Knight d5, and now bishop d2. Not much of a big deal going on, but it's really interesting to see how white is playing bishop d2 just to take away any chance for black to exchange. Now, I know that what, what you're thinking. When you look at this game, you're thinking, okay, but this is so slow. I mean, boring even in some way, isn't it? I mean, just like so slowly developing everything up. Isn't there a faster way to do this whole thing up? Well, in fact, what you got to remember is that speed always depends on what your opponent is going to do. And I, I know that it may sound strange, but really, it's like if your opponent doesn't have any real threats or things or dangerous possibilities, then why do you have to worry about being faster? I would say that instead of being faster, you just have to think about how you can reinforce everything and get everything in place. What was the purpose of Bishop H3? Well, I guess it won't be a bad idea if we just decide to commit a break on the uh, on that that point. So. Well, certainly thinking what well, was sort of certainly considering already the chance of attacking and destroying the one the one e6. So uh, that's what happened, <clears throat> and let's see. So after that move, Fisher's opponent just exchanged on g5. As long as the opponent doesn't have a great counterplay, remember to always reinforce. That is what actually helps you to build up a good position where you can make the attack. Are there any tactics yet? Not yet. It took out, it took a little bit of time to prevent any counterplay black could do on the queen side, but right now it's about just building up and trying to continue. The queen comes out, the knight goes forward, and here we go. We already have the right preparation and control. Now, white has a lot of forces, but what kind of patterns can we recognize in this position? Well, I'm going to leave that to you just for a moment because I believe that there are quite a few patterns that are so important out of this position. I like to say them because they're so good. Just need to figure out how they'll work. So what do you have in mind? How is black how is white supposed to continue with his attack? Couldn't black have played bishop c eight in this case? Uh, yeah, but uh, you see we're not talking about just a temporary type of attack on the e six, okay? I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the possibility to pressure on e six a long term. So that was the reason because you're asking what was the purpose of white to put his bishop on h three? Just just add a little to the pressure and that's it so the question is what to do now a good question and a stable stable idea like uh, obviously the queen is up we got a very good I mean a very good qualities for our pieces the bishops are perfectly well set so what is white supposed to do now how can we lead with the attack Knight f6, not bad. I mean, if white could really reach out and get that knight to advance towards the f f6, I'm gonna like that. I really will because, well, it it looks like a looks like a good move, and um, also it will certainly work out well. If if he takes it, we could recapture, open up a nice line against the opponent's king. But that's right. The key is finding out how to destroy the, the g pawn and possibly get open up the line. Queen g4, bishop f6. Yeah, but that won't be forcing. As I mentioned earlier, in such positions, the secret is in making sure you play f more forcingly, remember? You don't want to give him any time to consolidate. So let's just do bishop f6. Bishop f6 is a sacrifice. As always, it's risky. But there is a good purpose to that sacrifice. If black takes it, we have the chance to recapture it. So we're going to take one of his biggest defenders in the position. One of his most important pieces that could help his his defense will be gone. Well, per per personally to me, this looks, this looks a little more than just a good looking idea. It's it's brilliant. It's a good variation and that's what happened. Bishop f6. After the move of bishop f6, what was the black white calculation? <clears throat> it wasn't too complicated. Really, the calculation about this is that after g takes f, e takes f, and the black king moving, we have queen takes h7. One of the key tactical patterns that people miss, and I mean, I like to say that because people really miss it a lot, is that they almost never look at the main defender. 
They look at their attack, they try to find out moves to destroy the opponent, but they never, almost never ask what is keeping him safe. And if you get to really start asking that question, what is keeping my opponent safe and what's holding him together, you get to realize that there are lots of moves like bishop f6 that you definitely care about. So uh, that was very important and certainly working quite nicely. So bishop f6, black didn't take it. So he played queen e8. Okay, so queen to e8, a bit of a defense. So the question is, what's next? It was a nice pattern that white followed, but obviously that's not enough. So we have a bishop, we have a queen, and we got plenty of good looking pieces to try and prove that they will attack the opponent. Just have to figure out how exactly to do so. So what do you have in mind about black, about white right here? It's a great bishop, good looking queen, and a solid support. But what's next? What's the right follow up? <coughs> hmm. See, I really like the position as it stands for white, and mostly like that knight on f, uh, that bishop on f6, which is just fantastic. Queen g5, you suggested. Good. But then, what if black plays queen f8? You see, I think that uh, if he plays queen f8, he's going to be very well protected, and we can easily strengthen the attack. I mean, we can do the attack here. We got queen. He's got queen e f, queen e8. Can we do knight f3? Bring out, bring out this knight. Sure. But then. I just believe that black will play bishop b7, and the moment we come down, you do h6. I know, three pieces look great, but if you look more carefully, you'll find out that, uh, that even with those three on the line, I still don't believe that white can get any big threats. He can take on the g7, but then black will recapture, and there isn't much more going on in this position. That's unfortunate and true. Can we, tr can we try rook to e4, to sacrifice? No. You see, when I find out a position like that, I, I first of all ask myself the question, what is the obstacle? Don't do anything else before you really ask that question. What's the whole, what's, what's the thing that is holding white behind or preventing him from being able to reach out the king and attack out there most efficiently? I feel like there's this one thing that's holding us back and that one thing is the knight on c3 which prevents our own knight or the rook from getting ready and moving to, uh, directly against the black position. If we could find a way to do that Things would be great. Should it be with rookie four? No. It's too much of a sacrifice. Don't do it. If you see a sacrifice and you're not sure if you want to go for it, uh, I will suggest that mostly you don't. Think about a quiet move and how you can achieve your goal without denying the sacrifice. Just knight e4. It's not slow because white's got no co black's got no counter play. But what's important is that as soon as this move takes place, in case of the exchange, our rook is going to go forward. It's interesting that tactical patterns don't always go with the forcing move or the forcing continuation. In fact, the forcing move or the forcing continuation goes in the very end. In most times, the beautiful pattern that people get to miss is the, the tactical pattern of reinforcing. Yes, some will say, okay, it's not a tactical pattern. It is. It's not a motive or anything, but it is one of the ways on just bringing a little more to our attack so that finally we can break through. Black played g6, and now white plays queen g5. I have I actually realized from my whole career as a chess player, and I'm actually continuing it, that most of the Grandmaster games are not won by a brilliant sacrifice, but by just keeping the pressure the longer you can get. And the more you keep the pressure, the more difficult it becomes for your opponent to keep the defense. Black tries c4, and white plays h5. No need for a sacrifice and no need for anything amazing to happen. C takes D and rook H4. After all, one pawn was sacrificed, but uh, it wasn't that much needed. So, black plays rook to A7. So there is a there is this type of question here. How do we checkmate? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question, isn't it? Okay, so let's... I'm gonna give you a moment here so you can try to figure it out. You can try to process this position. It's an important position after all. We have a good queen, we have a nice bishop, and uh, you know, beautiful looking rook. So those forces that we have are definitely more than enough so we could do something. But yeah, I think the real the real important question is how do we do that stuff? If we have so much power and a good control, how do we make so that the opponent just loses this loses with his uh, you know with his king? How do we make the attack go in a most powerful way?
So I'm going to give you a moment here so that you take your time and think. A lot of firepower is definitely built on the king side. So that stands great. But how can we utilize that? This is the real question. What are you thinking? Yeah, one of you just said, I defended such positions. What, 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 what are you thinking? I like to say that those are the hardest position to win. You know, there's an expression in chess, the hardest thing to win is a winning position. Because, you know, when you have a winning position, you think that everything is good and there and brilliant. And you realize that it's not. And if you just don't, don't find a way to do something, you may even lose that type of advantage quickly. So, queen takes g6? No. I mean, when you're sacrificing your queen, you definitely need to have a great follow-up. I, I think black will just take with the f-pawn, and he's going to be safe on the h7. That's not going to work. Can we do queen h6? Sure, but then black would do that. Can we sacrifice the queen once said? No. He's just going to escape. We can't do that. I don't think this is going to work. h6g is possibly a fine idea, and after we take, uh, perhaps, uh, we can win a pawn or some material. Sure, but, uh, no. No. See, I think we're supposed to look for something a little more than a nice type of, you know, kind of att attack or something. It's, I believe that white deserves more. White deserves to destroy black's position. The question is how to do it. And let me teach you how to create pattern, you know, like m motives and patterns. See, motives uh, kind of happen generally. But uh, you can actually, you can ultimately, remember, create patterns. Now, one of the things about uh, creating patterns is that you got to figure out what is not working. People don't do that. They do a whole, of, uh, a whole lot of other stuff, but they rarely ask themselves why something is not working. Can we do bishop h8? Now, this is just a suggestion which has nothing to do with what we looked uh, previously. And uh, I don't think so. If we do that, black is just going to play dedix to the c. The moment we come down to f6, you mostly even promote a queen, if not to, and not to play queen f8. And okay, we'll take. You do that. Take perhaps maybe you don't promote, takes, captures, and uh, if our king goes down, I guess f takes g will work. So uh, in a short while, you'd have a defense, stable but still, you know, a defense. And uh, so so I don't believe that this is going to be a, a great looking move. You see, the success of bishop to h8 just doesn't work. And I mean, like the more we focus on that type of possibility, more and more you're going to be confused because it just doesn't work. Okay, so I know that you're now thinking, okay, but value bishop h8 and queen h6 and those moves don't work. And what should work? Essentially, we want to find out something that works. Can we take on e6? Nope. If we do. And black's going to do f takes d, and that's also not going to be a great idea, in my opinion. Can we do h takes g6? Nope, because after that, what black will play f takes g. See, we can look at a lot of moves like that, and and every single one of them is not going to work for a certain reason. Now, the secret, when you're looking at analyzing certain tactical variation, the secret, and don't forget that because it is essential. You think of it. It's not just in moving through the variation and saying, oh, it's good or no. Okay, it's not good. Let's move on to another one. It's about finding out why it's not good. I've always used to say that. If you want to be really successful with your calculation, find out why a certain line or a variation does not work. Don't just say, oh, it's not good and leave it. What you need to do is to figure out why is it not working. What is the thing that you'd like to work? And uh, uh, you know, uh, eventually you can figure out how to make it work. The problem that we have in this case, especially with the earliest combination of queen h6 and the attack on the h file, is that in some way, black comes in time. He's able to play the move of queen f8. If we exchange that queen, uh, the attack is over. And if we don't, well, that's pretty much you know also really not that great in the position. So I guess we need more forces. Unfortunately, it will be quite difficult and and uh, you know not that great to join the a1 rook. It will be a bit late, a bit too late to do that. But the good news is that we could bring out some of the other pieces. Imagine that bishop on h3 is not doing too much, right? After all, black's intending to do a, a couple of things on the queen side, and yet uh, this is not too threatening. I guess if we could figure out a way to create a checkmating attack, that would matter a whole lot more. We just need to figure out a way to do so. And uh, black found it. Yeah, white found it. Yes, he did. He not only found a way to do that, but he did it in a beautiful way. One of the best patterns 
is to realize what you need. What do you what do I need into my attack? You see the tactic it's working, but something is stopping it from being successful. And I think that it's just the power of that bishop. You know what White did? He just played bishop g2. Nobody would believe that a backward move like this could be good, but all that White does is that little reinforcement. Something that I told you about earlier. If your tactics don't work, don't push it. The worst type of scenario in chess attacks is that you push the position. If you push, you lose the control. You don't want to push. You want to keep it up, you want to hold the pressure for a little longer, and you want to enjoy the position. But whatever you do, do never push the position. Now with that kind of a move, it's pretty clear what White wants to do. He wants to get that bishop directly on the e4. He wants to put some extra tension against the g6, and eventually he'd like to uh, make queen h6 and some combinations work. After bishop g2, Black practically resigns. Why? Well, I mean, I just want to answer a question. What about bishop e7 with an idea if White then White plays uh, queen h6? No, that, that's not going to work because Black would just take it with the queen. And then if we move queen h6, I guess black will just take up there. So really, we're just going to lose one of our important pieces, which doesn't sound like one of the best things to go for. So talking about that is uh, not a really uh, great idea. Like I'm talking about bishop to e7. So uh, yes, bishop to g2 was certainly the best variation and most power, most important move to go uh, to go for. Bishop g2. How does that help, really? I mean, I, I know that you're you, you, you're probably going to say, I know that White's bishop is coming down to e4, but exactly how is this bishop going to be most successful out there? It's straightforward. When the bishop is on e4, it's going to pin the g6 pawn, and then there are beautiful sacrifices that White can make and work with them. So after the move of uh, d to the c, what happened in the position is that White played queen h6, Black did queen f8, and now. White did the final move. But before I show you, let me answer one question. What if black did the move of bishop b7? Would not have stopped that. He would, but it would also stop the black rook from defending, you see? So a fisher could do f take h takes g, rook takes h7, queen h4, and uh, because the rook was no de not there to protect the h7 square, obviously he gets checkmated in a, in a short moment or two. So that's that's actually not pretty good for for him, and uh, this is why he can't do this. So black does d takes to the c, queen h6, and queen f8. So what does white play now? We got a, a quite a few good-looking pieces, including our rook, the bishop, and even the queen into the play. So far, everything has been going great. So what's the right way for white to continue and carry on his activity now? Hmm. I mean, it's really fantastic to have a development like this one. But what do we do next? How to make this attack work? Queen takes h7? Absolutely. You know how many chess players literally forget to think about forcing moves? And especially they forget they get to forget about checks. They forget, they think they forget about captures, they forget about direct threats. And that's one of the most important things you should never forget. When you're attacking, the worst scenario is that you forget about the forcing moves. Or you just stop looking at them. This is not good. And so, uh, White knew very well that a move like queen takes h7, if not played, should be at least considered. See, when I say to one, uh, some of my students, "Okay, look at this sacrifice," and they say, "Oh, this is terrible. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna play it," and I say, and I, then I say, "But nobody is making you to play it. Just think about it. If you like it, if you think that there is a good, you know, purpose to it, you can play it. If you don't, you don't need to play it. Nobody's asking you to play it." Just think about it. That's where the problems really, really come from. People don't calculate things because they look impossible. They look bad. And I say, if you think a little more with that, you'll realize that it's not too bad. After queen takes h7, king takes h7, now we get to finally realize why white needed so much to have his light square bishop around, because he can bring it towards the e4, and uh, it's a really bad type of situation. After queen bishop e4, there's a checkmate. So black is ultimately losing. It's it's pretty amazing. So uh, you see, finding the tactical pattern is a final thing you do. 
And it's important that you see them because if you don't, then you can get to this, you're going to get to this position. And you're going to wonder how do I make the attack happen. So it's important to know the kind of pattern. Like for example, the pattern of of defense destruction that White had with Queen takes H7, he definitely worked out very beautifully. Now, but all of that happened thanks to White's preparation and move and opportunity to just get so much stronger out there in order to reach out for this position and finally do it. It was very good, beautifully played, and in the end of the day after queen takes h7, king takes h7, and ultimately the move of h6, g6. Of course, the king can't come back because of the checkmate, and he can't come forward because of the same thing. If it goes to the g6, then we're just going to play with bishop e4, and it's checkmate. So, you see, recognizing patterns is something, like tactical patterns, is something that can happen at any point, but most, mostly, you want to see those type of possibilities when you're at a position where you're in, in at the time and at the time when you're ready all these little things like the little prophylaxis the pattern of concentrating more pieces they're also valuable patterns and although they don't immediately relate to an actual combination you have in the future they give you the resources to make it at a later stage now when we get the pieces don't forget the most important tactical pattern is not in finding some big tactics some big move but asking yourself what do i need you know, this is something when I say that to someone, they say, oh, this is definitely important. But you're going to find that 98% of the chess players who attack or look for attack, they don't do it. They just calculate and calculate, their, 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 their head burns, they keep calculating, and they don't pause and ask, why did that line not work? So remember one advice from me. If you calculate and you dismiss line one after another after another, you're going to probably miss a lot of things. So what you need to do is to very carefully decide on why certain moves or possibilities don't work, and then you will know. Like for example, in this position, everything was not working because we were needing, we were in need of one more piece. We got it, and then the attack worked.